Welcome compadres. Today we're going to continue on the concept of fastener design. Specifically we're going to look at the ultimate loading condition. So when we think of fasteners we essentially think of two states. When it's preloaded and when it's not preloaded. And so in the preloaded case we're looking at joint separation, joint slip, and fastener fatigue. So we know over time a fastener has a tendency to lose preload over to the life of which it was installed on. So now we have to look at the unpreloaded case and that's what we're doing in this case. So essentially what we're doing is we're putting the fastener in the hole loosely, no preload, and we're basically impounding the loads and we're saying will, will the, or we're asking the question, will the fastener survive the loads if it takes on all the loading from the loading condition, whatever it may be, the environment, whatever. And so that's what we're looking at here. Some key concepts before we dig into the details is the fastener interaction equations. This is basically the failure criteria used to evaluate fasteners in the aerospace industry. So what it is, it is it describes the interaction between shear and or tension and or bending. In this presentation and in the Excel workbook that we're going to go through after this, we'll consider all three conditions at the same time simultaneously. And ultimately where this model comes from is Brun's textbook on space vehicles. That's kind of like the Bible of structural engineering in the aerospace industry. So if you're not familiar with it, I go read it. I think it'll clear some some uh, concepts that I'm talking about here. And it'll go into a little more detail but it takes into account combined shear bending and tension loads. So let's consider for a second the joint right here. Essentially we have a tensile or compression load and then we have a resultant shear load and we pull these directly out of our FEA analysis so these are easy to obtain. So let's just remove the tension load for a second and look at just the shear load and what effect it has on the fastener. So if we draw a free body diagram of this, what we have is something we, we can assume it looks like this. We have a uniform distributed load acting on the fastener where the joint is pulling against it. We have this gap where no load is acting and then we have a uniform distributed load acting from this bottom joint. And so if you look at these it's going to tend to rotate the fastener and this will produce reaction loads underneath the head and along the nut as shown here to counteract that rotation. If we don't have that then the fastener is just going to spin, right? Where a fastener is likely to fail is in this area right here where the shank or the threads are. And this is the region we want to evaluate. So if we assume some reaction loads, some eccentric distance from the mid line of the shank region we should be able to transfer the loads to this region so that we can just look at the loads right here in the middle and that's what we're going to do so in order to do that you use your method of sections uh, which you've learned in statics you make a cut here right above where the the distributed load acts and then a cut down here and you solve for the internal forces and reaction forces so if you do that essentially you end up with free body diagrams that look like this so on the top here you have an internal load and moment acting right here and then the equal and opposite is going to be acting right here on the shank area and then we look at the bottom and we just trace the loads again we end up with something like this where the moment is calculated by multiplying this reaction load by the distance to the mid span of the fastener so that's what we get so now what we want to do for the interaction equations we're essentially going to need the worst case moment the worst case shear and the worst case normal force so if we draw our shear force diagram of this this loading condition right here, what we end up with is a diagram that looks like this. It goes up linearly to the, the distributed load and then we flatline here where the gap is and then it goes back down to zero to maintain equilibrium. And so the worst case shear load happens in the middle here and it's equal to the resultant shear load.
which we know. We can calculate that by pulling the forces out of our FEA model. That's easy to do. The next thing to do is to determine our moment. Worst case moment. So we know from a free body diagram that this moment on top and this moment on the bottom are going to be equal to each other. So what does that lead us to assume? In order to maintain equilibrium, this curve has to be symmetric, right? That makes sense. So now to determine our worst case moment, we can just rely on geometry. So we just take the area under this curve the shear force diagram and we divide it by two because we know this curve is symmetric that'll give us our worst case moment which is acting just underneath the head and just above the nut so we have our worst case moment now one of our unknowns is the reaction force well we can go back to our free body diagram and we can determine our reaction force Q simply using this equation now that we know the moment so we basically have everything we need so far. Now what we want to do is calculate or determine the worst case normal force. So we're going to go ahead and add our tensile load back in right here. We add it back in and we just add it to Q and we draw our normal force diagram. And we end up with something that looks like this where our worst case normal force is uniform throughout the section of our threaded region or shank region. So we have everything we need. We can pull this out of our FEA, this F, this tensile load. We have everything we need. Now we can go to the interaction diagrams and see if our fastener will fail. So our interaction diagrams or interaction curves are basically given by these relations right here and these are empirically derived for each fastener so essentially they're going to test and break fasteners and they're going to fit a curve that follows uh, equation like this with different exponents and it's going to have our tensile load ratio or tensile bending ratio and our tensile shear ratios which is essentially just defined as the load over the allowable so our shear load ratio is going to be our shear force, worst case shear force, over our shear allowable. Our tensile allowable is going to be our worst case normal force over our tensile allowable of our fastener. And then our worst case bending, or our load ratio for bending is going to be our worst case moment over our bending allowable. And these can be determined, you know, pretty easily. Um, I'll go into this in another video, but that's the definition of our load ratios. We calculate each of those and then we plot it on this interaction diagram, which plots our load ratio, tension, bending versus our shear load ratio. We end up with an operating point. And as long as this operating point falls below the curve that we're looking at, um, depending on which one we use, it can change. But if it falls below it, we're good. So the next thing to do is to determine a margin of safety. So margin of safety is, is essentially just taking this one of these curves that you're evaluating. For example, the linear curve, as long as it's less than this relation on the left is less than one, we know that our fastener is going to survive the combined loads. And so we just write that mathematical relation right here, and we can do it for each of these curves, um, just to emphasize the point I'm making here. And then we just move everything to the right side. And as long as this relation over here is greater than zero, we know that our operating point is below the curve. And so to make this easier, um, we can relate this zero to a margin of safety because a lot of times when we look at margin of safety, if it's greater than zero, well, then we know that our margin of safety is positive. So we just substitute our margin of safety in for that and put an equal sign in. And that's our margin of safety for these curves. And sometimes in literature, you'll find like this relation right here encapsulated by a square root. <clears throat> you know, it, whatever floats your boat. I mean, this is the same thing. It just tells me that my operating point is below the curve if my margin of safety is positive. That's all it tells me. So, that's how it works, guys, and I hope you learned something. We're going to go actually into Excel and put this all together into one spreadsheet and uh, see an application of this um, 
So uh, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you next time. Adios.